Long before the days of texting and email, the fastest way to get a long distance message to someone was by train. Mail was a huge commodity for the railroads. Mail by rail in the United States peaked in the 1940s and 50s, with dedicated trains carrying upwards of 300 tons of mail daily. It was picked up and sorted on the fly in railway post office cars. But as you probably expected, competition from new highways and airlines caused a sharp decline in America's passenger rail network in the 60s. The post office department canceled all of its first class mail by rail contracts by 1967, and only one mail train route remained in 1971. It was a New York to Washington DC train run by Penn Central. These cuts hurt the railroads badly as, by this point, mail often provided for most of the revenue on passenger trains. The US government then created Amtrak in May 1971 to take over and revitalize most of the nation's passenger rail routes. A while later, in 1976, Conrail took over for the bankrupted Penn Central, and they ran the final mail train with RPO service on June 30th, 1977. So it seemed the days of mail by rail were over. Well, not exactly. While trucks and airlines became the primary method for moving mail, Amtrak would continue hauling second and third class mail, and freight railroads hauled truck trailers that carried mail. With America's overzealous attitude towards roads at the time, the lack of rail transport and increase in road transport led to congestion and delays moving high-priority mail. Airlines had the same problem too. The US Postal Service looked to the railroads for help, specifically Amtrak. Why them? Amtrak usually had priority over freight trains and ran at much higher speeds which would keep expedited mail moving. So, from 1986 to 88, Amtrak took delivery of new material handling cars, 61-foot-long boxcars with passenger trucks built for higher speeds. These cars were coupled onto trains and loaded or unloaded at larger stations. This new service, dubbed Amtrak Express, allowed people and companies to ship bulk mail in smaller packages. After just a couple years in service, though, a serious problem arose with the 1400 series boxcars. The rebuilt trucks came from decades-old Railway Express Agency cars and reports of cracks, hunting oscillations, and derailments started rolling in. They were limited to 60 miles per hour and sidelined until repairs could be made. This freight endeavor also came with new logistical costs for switching the cars and equipment maintenance. Apart from that, the new service was actually profitable. You got too much money, honey. Common loads seen within these cars were palletized goods, newspapers, Hello. magazines, and catalogs. September 1996 brought in Ed Ellis as senior director for the Mail and Express sector at Amtrak. His position had him seeking out ways to grow the railroad's burgeoning freight business. At the time, Amtrak was facing some financial troubles with less government support, so freight seemed like a good way to try and make some extra cash. Meanwhile, Southern Pacific had merged into Union Pacific, and Conrail was being split between CSX and Norfolk Southern. These corporate shakeups created delays as each railroad's operating system was completely different from one another. To start, press any key. Where's the any key? This made it hard on shippers to quickly move freight by rail. Amtrak spotted an opportunity. In 1997, they acquired 50 boxcars. They were standard 50-foot designs painted green, supposedly as a callback to the Railway Express Agency cars of old. 300 more were delivered in Amtrak colors by 2001. These had to be coupled to the rear of trains due to the lack of head-end power cables. Union Pacific wasn't a fan of this new competition. Claiming that moving freight was an exclusive right of freight railroads. On the other end of this tug of war, Amtrak was asking the Service Transportation Board to get UP to host their longer trains with express freight. The initial ruling stated Amtrak may run on UP tracks with a total of 18 cars, of which at most 9 cars may carry express merchandise. UP also wanted to limit Amtrak's express freight to less than truckload shipments, which in turn would reduce their customer base. In May 1998, the STB ruled that Amtrak's express services should not be restricted and instead be seen as a premium alternative to the freight railroads. 
And with that, Amtrak expanded further into freight with road railers. These truck trailers allowed for railroad wheels to be attached for ease of transportation. The refrigerated variants proved popular with climate-controlled shippers, who preferred the railroad schedules over trucks. The last freight car Amtrak received were 55 briefers to haul fresh produce, operated under contract for Express Track. Throughout the latter half of the 90s and early 2000s, it wasn't uncommon to essentially see a small freight train's worth of freight cars behind an Amtrak. On long-distance trains, Express Freight sometimes provided over half of the train's revenue. This extra revenue even kept the Texas Eagle from being cancelled. Consists could be over 30 cars long, something unheard of for the railroad apart from the auto train. Routes like the Three Rivers, Kentucky Cardinal, and Lake Country Limited all began with a focus on freight, but also offered limited passenger service. The fast mail in the Northeast even had a mail and freight exclusive train. Amtrak and USPS's partnership strengthened even more with the Century Express. It was a promotional train that toured the U.S. with exhibits on board to commemorate the past 100 years of postal history. With this new focus on freight and mail, Amtrak's yearly revenue went from $44 million in 1996 to over $120 million in 2001. Safe to say Amtrak was doing pretty decent for themselves. All of this was part of the Network Growth Strategy Plan, spearheaded by President George Warrington and Ed Ellis. This strategy wasn't to last forever, though. Experienced transit leader David L. Gunn took the helm as Amtrak president in 2002. After re-evaluating expenses, he wanted to pull the railroad out of freight for a variety of reasons. For starters, there were the freight railroads. Norfolk Southern blocked the startup of the Skyline Connection mixed train over track congestion concerns, BNSF limited Amtrak to five freight cars unless they wanted to pay a fee, and Union Pacific wasn't happy with new competition. The boxcars also proved problematic, the main issue being rough riding when empty. Amtrak was hoping they'd have enough backhaul traffic to prevent empty cars, but instead they would have loads going east and empties west. The freight railroads also restricted Amtrak's speed with empties, causing them to be late. Trains would miss the mail truck, and there would be penalty fees from the Postal Service. All of this led Amtrak to discontinue their mail and express freight service in October 2004. Express track reefers continued operating until 2006 out of contractual obligation. So, what's left of Amtrak's mail and express service? The MHCs were scrapped, sold off, or put into maintenance service, and the road railers, boxcars, and reefers were sold off to various companies where they remain in service. Amtrak would continue offering a smaller scale version of their shipping service, with goods being loaded into baggage cars. However, since October 2020, Amtrak Express has been suspended indefinitely. Amtrak's experiment in Mail and Express freight came at a time when trucks were proving too slow, and a return to mail by rail seemed viable. They doubled down on freight in the 90s as a way to increase profits. But the delays to passengers, opposition from freight railroads, mechanical problems, and costly switching logistics had Amtrak shifting focus back to their bread and butter, passengers. While the freight railroads still move mail and express freight in containers and truck trailers, Amtrak's experiment harkened back to the golden age of American railroads, where mail and passengers often ran as one fast train. Thank you to my channel members. Special thanks to Grand Canyon Studios, Tommy Rosini, and Mooter for subscribing to the Conductor tier.